to know Jesus and to make him known. If this is your first Sunday joining us, um, we are so glad that you are here and we are excited to worship with you this morning. Um, before we hop in, just a couple announcements. Next Sunday, June 4th, is Move Up Sunday for incoming sixth graders um, and incoming ninth graders for our youth ministries so they can head to those Sunday schools. You probably have an email about that um, if you haven't heard about it yet. Next Sunday, we also have a congregational meeting during the Sunday school hour. So if you're a member here, um, we'd love you to come out to that. And one thing that will be happening in that meeting um, is, is voting to install um, Clint um, permanently as a pastor at our church. So that's an exciting thing we'd love. Um, if you're a member here, we'd love you to attend that. We also have a picnic after the service next week. Um, and so if you like picnics, that'd be a good Sunday to come to church too. Um, okay, that's about all we have for announcements. Um, and so this morning is really special for me. This is, this is my last Sunday on staff here, and so it's an honor and a privilege um, to have led worship here the last couple years um, and this morning. And I'm so excited to have my friend, um, my good friend, Pastor Jim Lovelady, um, join us this morning. Um, if you know Jim and Lori, they've been around the New Life Circles forever. Um, and they've, I know they've been a blessing to many people here, so we're excited to have him. Um, today, we are starting a new sermon series. We're taking a break from the book of John, and hopping into the book of Proverbs for the summer. And so, if you are familiar with the book of Proverbs, you know that the word wisdom comes up a lot. That seems to be a running theme in that book. Um, one, probably one of the most quoted verses from the book of Proverbs. It's Proverbs 1-7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It goes on to say, fools despise wisdom and instruction. And so what does that have to do with us this morning? The God that we worship, that we are gathered here this morning to worship, is wisdom himself. He is all that is good, right, and true. And everything in our world that is good, right, and true originates from him, wisdom himself. And so rather than look for what is good, right, or true, or loving, rather than trying to find that in ourselves, rather than trying to find that somewhere else in another person, um, in an idea, in a group. We are here to worship the only one who can offer us those things. Wisdom himself, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who loves us and lavishes us with grace that we don't deserve. 
And that is the wise king that we worship this morning. So I would invite you to stand as we read a call to worship. Um, this is from the book of Revelation, um, where John is having this vision from God that leads him to worship Jesus. He's the only wise and true king, the only one worthy of his praise. So I'll read the first part. You can respond. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals together. Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people from every tribe, language, and people, and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God.
worthy. You may be seated. And so as we've just sung about our King Jesus, who alone is worthy of our trust, who himself is wisdom, we are faced with the reality that there is a pretty big gap between these truths and our lived experience. I can think of just this past week a moment where I was freaking out, despairing about life, making judgments about God's love for me and his wisdom in my life. It was almost like I was saying, God, if you saw what I saw or know what I know, you'd realize you aren't taking good care of me. You'd be doing things differently. I don't know if you can relate to that. That sounds crazy, right? I think sin is crazy. And so if you felt that way and you've said things like that to God like I did this week, I, the Spirit convicted me through a conversation with a friend that ultimately what that is, that's, it's not just unbelief, it's also pride. It's arrogance. Believing that God doesn't know what he's doing, that he's not wise, that he doesn't love me, that he doesn't love you, and that you and I can find the help we need within ourselves, within our own wisdom, our own might, or in another person. Or maybe we choose none of those options and we just simply settle for despair. But thankfully, the story doesn't have to end there. We are like sheep, the Bible says. And rather than scowl at us or look down with disdain upon you and I, our shepherd looks down upon our sinful and prideful and arrogant and unbelieving condition with deep compassion ready to spring forward, to lift us up out of our despair, out of our shame, and to hold us in his arms. And so if this is who our shepherd is, don't we want to trust him? Don't we, don't we want to repent and know this shepherd and be right with him and be loved by him instead of searching around for the spiritual junk food that, that's never going to fill us? And so this morning, our good shepherd invites us to confess our pride, our unbelief, our pursuit of wisdom that leaves him out of the picture, so that he can restore us to receiving his wisdom, his love, his care, his deep compassion for you and I that can't be found anywhere else. And so I'm going to read us a passage from Proverbs, and then if we could just pray silently for a few moments, and then we'll continue. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching. For they are a graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. Spend a few moments in silent prayer.
by the grace in his eyes of grace. He's an ocean we're all sinking. So heaven meets earth like a sloppy wet kiss. My heart turns violent inside my chest. I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about all the ways that he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, himself is moved to such compassion and such love towards our helpless state, towards our sin and our rebellion and our failure, that his response is to spring forward from heaven to earth, to bear our guilt, to bear our shame, our unfaithfulness, and nail it on the cross once and for all, for all eternity. And he says, it is finished. And because it is finished, you and I get to now live in the ocean of his grace and spend the rest of our lives figuring out how deep it is and we're still not going to figure it out and we didn't do a single thing to earn this he gives it to us freely it's not fair we just receive it so would you read this assurance of forgiveness with me from first corinthians but god chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise god chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Amen. The children are dismissed as we boast in this great joy that we have. Breaks of power seen in darkness love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings shakes the ruler with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings Amazing. 
amazing grace This is unfailing love He would take my place I sing for that you don't for brings our chaos back into order who leaves the old Son and daughter, the King of glory, the King of glory, rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance, the King of glory, the King above all kings. For oh, yeah, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You lay down your life That I would be set free Ooh, Jesus, I sing for All that you done for me Conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You lay down your life That I would be saved She's done, done for me. me. Amen. This is good news. You may be seated. Good morning. Would you pray with me? What a gift it is to worship you today, Lord, with the saints. We thank you for the opportunity to do that, for the freedom that we have to do that. Lord, it's, uh, it's fitting that we honor and thank you for those that gave their life this Memorial Day, uh, for the freedoms that we have to express our faith here in this place. Lord, what a gift that is. Lord, many places in this continent don't have that opportunity we know that you've given us a great gift. May we use it and not lose it, Lord. Would you help us to daily thank you for those freedoms? But, Father, saying that, we also know that the freedoms that we have, we walk into this place today, some of us come with heavy hearts. Some of us come with joyful hearts. Some of us come, Lord, with our fist in the air saying, what are you doing, Lord? Some of us come, Lord, with our hands stretched out and saying, do what you do, Lord. 
But Lord, God, you didn't withhold your hand from your son opening them on the cross. He took the nails for our sins, for our rebellion, for the things that we labor over, fall short of. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for that incredible gift that he gave us. Father, these are reminders that we might pray to the God who loves us to that degree, loves us eternally, that we pray to a God who hears us. It's the same God who said to Job, where were you when I laid out the four corners of the universe? The magnitude of believing in that and the same, the same God who loves us through your death of, the death of Jesus. Lord, what incredible contrast of power and humility, giving up our, your life, Jesus, for us. Would you help us to trust you today with the events in our life? Would you daily remind us of that? Would you use your gospel, the words of the scriptures, to encourage and direct the steps that we take each and every day? I pray for the ministries of this church as a response to your great love for us. Would each one of them, Lord, do it for the sake of Jesus, for what he has done for us, not as a heavy load, not as a repayment, but our hearts overflowing with thanksgiving, for we cannot repay you for what you did, but we can express our lives as one of service and gratitude. So would that be established in this church? Would we not just know you, but would we make you known through our works of love, of service, of speech, of care, of fellowship? Lord, the world around us is dying. Would you help us to navigate that world with the love of Christ? Would you show us those paths daily in the places that we live and hang out? I pray especially for the kids, the children in schools, that you would encourage them and strengthen them in their faith to love those in their midst. Help them to navigate that, that challenging path. Today we pray for our loved ones that are carrying significant loads of health, health issues. We pray for Zach Tussing. We pray, Father, that you would heal his, the pain in his head, in his brain, um, that the surgery would take complete healing uh, for this young man. Would you give him hope, Lord? Would you give him encouragement? He needs, he needs our prayers. Lord, we pray, too, for Joy Kerr. We think about her and the significant back surgery she had recently. Would you help her and those that care for her to manage her pain, that she might be restored to full health as well? Please be with her, Lord. We pray for others in our congregation that are carrying things that we don't know about. Uh, you know all about them. Um, would you minister to them now, Father? We're thankful for the life of uh, Kathy Beebe's mom, who went with the Lord yesterday. After a short time on hospice, Lord, with Kathy and Don by her side, she left this earthly tent to be with her Savior, Jesus. We uh, pray for that family as they consider these things, these deep, significant things. And now for our brother, we pray that as he comes, Anthony, that you would equip him with confidence and with the word to feed our souls and direct our steps. Lord, care for him and his family as he loves this congregation and sacrifices and dies to himself to do so. And that's true for the rest of our staff and pastors and elders, small group leaders, deacons. Lord, just dying to self to love our congregation. So be with him today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This morning's reading is from Proverbs 1, 1 through 7. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity. To give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance. To understand a proverb and a saying, 
the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. This is the word of the Lord. Well, <clears throat> good morning, New Life. It is good to be with you today. My name is Anthony Gamage. I'm the lead pastor here where we exist to know Jesus and make him known. And I like to say on these combined service Sundays, first service, meet second service, second service, meet first service. Uh, it, it is wonderful to be in the same room together. Uh, friends, as we get going here this morning, we need to do a little bit of family business here. So I want to invite Tommy to, to come on back up here uh, for just a second. As uh, we've said a couple of times that uh, this is Tommy's last week with us in a formal capacity. Come on all the way over. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab you. Um, so this is Tommy's last week with us in a formal capacity as our director of worship and as our junior high uh, coordinator. Uh, and uh, the reason this is his last week, he'll still be uh, around, right, over the course of the next several months. But uh, the reason this is his last week is because he's now moving into a phase of support raising as we are sending him out. Uh, to head over to London with Surge to work among the uh, Southeast Asian community there, sharing the gospel with them. And so uh, it is both um, uh, sadness that I'm experiencing and many of us are experiencing today, but also joy of the Lord's call in this man's life uh, as we are sending him out. We're going to have another opportunity to hear from him a little bit further down the road as he prepares to leave. But, but this morning, I, I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. So uh, for me, uh, I, met, uh, I met this guy, it was probably it was nine years ago. You were on your college journey. Were you just starting out, right? Uh, so I remember just having these meetings with this guy I just met at a wedding and then at the Village Diner over in Keswick and, and really just processing life and, and, and what navigating college looks like and what navigating life after college looks like. And so I was quite thrilled when I heard that he was coming back from Nashville after a season there, uh, and uh, as we happened to be searching for a new worship director at that time, I thought, well, I'm going to call Tommy, and so uh, God, in his uh, kindness to us, uh, sent Tommy to be with us in this season, and so uh, Tommy started, and he had about eight whole weeks of normalcy as a worship director, and then a global pandemic broke out, uh, and then after that, he just shepherded us unbelievably uh, into a time of virtual church, uh, and then kind of plotted along with us and shepherded us out of that as it came to being a worshiping community and has shepherded our, our worship teams just so beautifully. And then he took on this role of being our, our middle school or junior high coordinator in which he has loved and ministered to many of your kids and mine. Sorry. I tried. I was trying. Um, this week, uh, we went out as a staff team and uh, we just went around the table and we said, hey, let's share a memory of Tommy uh, and then let's also encourage him. And so, uh, to share a couple of the themes, I'm embarrassing you now, and that's okay. Um, uh, some of the themes that we shared are joy. Uh, if you know Tommy and you've been in a room with Tommy, he brings joy and a light to any of those rooms, be it the staff room or with middle schoolers or up here, just hanging out. In fact, that's one of the things I will miss the most is uh, just cutting up and, and hanging out uh, in the office with him. Uh, the term care came up. Uh, we articulated that there is not a human being that we know who does a more unbelievable job of just asking questions to, to draw out the oldest and the youngest in our midst and, and, and somehow able to turn a phrase to, to point us quickly to the gospel and to Jesus. Uh, we also talked about this dude is a talented, talented man when it comes to music uh, and his creation of beauty. And then something that many of you may not see is uh, he is one of the most gifted people I've ever met at shepherding groups of people, uh, be it a worship team or young people. He is just so gifted in uh, those things, and you will, you will often not even see it or even notice it if you're one of the ones who he is shepherding. And so um, I just want to say I will miss you greatly. My family will miss you greatly because you've poured into all of us, and um, we will miss you greatly. Um, but there's a story of Sarah, and when she was younger growing up, her youth leader uh, went to the missions field, and, and the story is that of her, his mom uh, hugging him goodbye at the airport and just sobbing, of course, and then she hugs him and she says, uh, I give you gladly. And so for us as a church, we do grieve, right, but we also give you gladly to this awesome work that the Lord has equipped you and called you to do. And so um, can we just give thanks to the Lord for Tommy these past three years?
Thank you, Jeff. I'm going to pray for you. If you would, uh, allow me to pray for Tommy. You can sit down. You can sit down. You're good. I'm going to pray for Tommy and then pray for our time in the Word here uh, this morning. Uh, Lord, I thank you and praise you for our brother and friend, Tommy. Uh, Lord, we are very grateful for uh, how you have fearfully and wonderfully made him and the gift that he's been to us, Lord, well beyond when he entered official capacities here. And Lord, for the blessing I know that he will be for years to come. Uh, Lord, I want to pray for him particularly this morning as he, um, Lord, as this is just an emotional, emotional morning uh, for him, for his family. Uh, Father, I pray for him as he just begins to process what's happened in the last three years because if he's like many of us in ministry, uh, we don't process very often. And so, Lord, when the waves of emotions hit him, I pray that you will meet him quickly in that, knowing that uh, you, Jesus, uh, in your humanity, identify with him deeply in that. And Lord, as the enemy would love to whisper things in his ear that aren't true, I pray that you would just protect him from those things, uh, Father. Um, but allow him to process well, allow him to process well with us, uh, cause us to love him well as he walks this road. And, and Father, he is getting ready to jump on this road full time of support raising, and it's a road I have been on, and Lord, I know the ups and downs of it. And so I pray that you would make those he approaches generous, Lord, make those he doesn't approach generous to, to Lord, provide for his every need in Christ Jesus. Lord, you are the owner of a cattle of a thousand hills, which means you own it all. And Lord, I pray that he would rest in that and your provision for him as he does what feels very uncomfortable, what is very uncomfortable for us in our society. But Father, may it be a faith-building exercise for him. Uh, Lord, pave the way. I pray that he will um, be able to raise what he needs uh, in order to go out. And Father, uh, I pray that he would also have the eyes of faith to see that uh, it's this very road uh, that can be difficult, that prepares his heart for what you have called him to on the field. And so, uh, Lord, would you be doing that and be preparing him for this ministry that you have called him to, an important one, a strategic one. Uh, Father, I pray uh, that this man will see much fruit come from you in this ministry uh, where he will go, and I pray that you would uh, protect him from the evil one as, uh, as he heads out as well. And so, uh, Lord, uh, use him. Uh, Lord, again, thank you uh, for uh, the gift of Tommy for these years in this capacity. And Lord, uh, give us as your church the eyes of faith uh, to see what you are doing uh, in our midst as well. So, uh, Lord, we do pray now for the sermon. And, and Lord, I ask you to, to use your word and the preaching of it to make us wise in you. Uh, Lord, so would you help us with that? Thanks that your spirit is with us, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'm not sure how to segue from that, but uh, I, I have to, and so um, uh, we're going to begin here this morning uh, by looking, we're starting a summer series in the book of Proverbs, and so it's going to be quite a different feel from uh, the narratives that we have been walking through from the book of John, but if you have your Bibles, I would love to invite you to open them up to Proverbs chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 1 to 7 this morning. The book of Proverbs, if you're wondering, if you have a print Bible, it's just to the left of center, right after the Psalms. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, uh, you can look in the bulletin, it's there, or feel free to open it on your device. But um, the book of Proverbs is a book about wisdom, right? That's one of the prevailing words. It's in the genre of wisdom literature in Scripture. And so I thought it would be interesting uh, to do some quick homework to look up uh, different words of wisdom that have come to us over the decades. And so, you know, I've tried to capture 60s, 80s, 2000s, and a little bit of modernity here. So let's tune our ears to this wisdom. Let's see if you remember some of these phrases. Ready? Some wisdom over the ages. Ready? In the future, everyone will be world famous for 15 minutes. Any idea who said that? Yes, Andy Warhol, right? 15 minutes of fame, fame is fleeting. That's what that's getting after. How about this one? Ask not what you can do uh, or what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. JFK, nailed it. Good work so far. Um, here's the 80s. All right, this is big. Ready? Be excellent to each other. <laughs> Bill and Ted. Bill and Ted. Bill and Ted's excellent adventure. Keanu Reeves' breakthrough performance. Um, how about this one? Life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while, you'll, you could miss it. This is, this is a... Ferris Bueller, that's right. <laughs> Quite the philosopher. Um, the 2000s, ready? What we do in life echoes in eternity. 
Yeah. Uh, like two people? Really? You got Andy Warhol and not that? Okay. Uh, Gladiator. Um, glad, it was from the movie Gladiator. Uh, Maximus Aurelius, right? Is that, is that, am I saying that right? All right, how about this one? This isn't necessarily 2000s. It was popularized in movie form. With great power comes great responsibility. Spider-Man, y'all. Come on, Spider-Man. All right, so for the, for the young or, or parents of young children in, our, in, in, in the room, uh, Fisher Friends, not food. <laughs> Finding Nemo. Okay. Three more. Three more. This is all the same person, right? This is, this is modern day and age. Um, let's see if you can get it. Let's see how long it takes you. From obscurity to duh. Uh, never believe anyone who says you don't deserve what you want. Okay, wait for it. Here's the second one. So don't you worry your pretty little mind. People throw rocks at things that shine. Taylor Swift, yeah. The King family over here is very excited about getting that right. Here's the last one, shake it off. Okay, that would have been the dad giveaway. Um, for those of you who went to the Taylor Swift worship service, uh, there's your, <laughs> there are your quotes. Um, ha, 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 ha. Okay, so there, there are our words of wisdom from this morning. Uh, we're not going to close in prayer at that point, but, but why do we remember those things? Why are these little pithy phrases of words of wisdom, why, why are they appealing to us? Why do we sometimes even search these sorts of things out? Well, I would argue it's because we are all on that quest for wisdom. We all are on a quest looking for wisdom. Whether we realize it or not, we, we need insight. We desire right understanding of, of the situation that's going on right in front of us. We oftentimes, so wisdom certainly helps us discern things like right from wrong, but, but often wisdom is the thing that we need most when we encounter life in the gray, when it's not necessarily this clear moral choice, but, but when we're going, okay, um, should I confront this person about this thing? How should I do it? Should I marry this person? Should I send my child to this sort of school? Should I invest in this sort of investment, right? Those are all questions that don't necessarily have a this is right and this is wrong, but we still yearn for what is the best decision to make here. Now, where do we look for these, this, these little nuggets of wisdom? I named some of them. Uh, now, I will say, here's what our culture tells us. The first place we start is, is this. We start here. We start in ourselves, right? That's the number one place that our modern individualistic culture tells us we are going to find wisdom. It's pretty American or pretty Western, right? But that's one aspect. Social media, our favorite influencers, news, philosophers, a different religion, maybe throw all the religions in a blender and see what we get, right? That's, those are really the areas that we as people tend to go and look for wisdom. And here's what I would say is we often look for wisdom to navigate the world in places that might be quite foolish. Well, here's what God's Word tells us at the very beginning. There's an invitation as we open this today uh, in 1 verse 2. It simply says this, no wisdom. The Bible invites us to join on that search to know what wisdom actually is. It's not hiding it from us. In fact, we have a whole genre of literature here where God says, hey, I am going to show you where you can find wisdom. And so this summer, these passages and these sermons are hopefully going to be highly practical. These first three weeks are going to be introductory, and then, you know, the Proverbs are a bunch of pithy little sayings that uh, it doesn't read like John. We're not going to be going, you know, Proverbs 1, 2, and 3 for long, right? We're going to end about three, and we're going to begin to go, okay, like, let's pull from different chapters to understand what God's Word says about wisdom about different topics. So we're going to be talking about things uh, like parenting and, and, and work and wise usages of money. And so uh, that's, that's where we're headed here this summer. So here's the invitation. The invitation this morning is to a whole host of people. Verse 4, the invitation is to the simple. Uh, this is to people who are not yet wise, right? There's an invitation for us to grow in wisdom. Second, it's to youth, Right? It's calling young people to gain wisdom. There is about 20 young people who are getting ready to head out to college, who just graduated from our youth group this year. Now, let me just say, there's probably no more important book that you can sit in right before you launch into college than a book about getting wisdom. And I would say beyond that to any young people, the younger you grab on to wisdom, the better off things often turn out. 
But then it's not just for the simple or the youth, it's also for those who are already wise. Verse 5, let the wise hear and increase in learning. So friends, this is an invitation to all of us. There's none of us who have graduated from wisdom, and so that's why we are spending some time in it this morning and the rest of this summer. So here's three questions we're going to try to answer this morning. One, what is wisdom? Two, what does it look like? And then three, we're going to look at how do we get it? So what is wisdom, what does it look like, and how do we get it? So first, let's look at what wisdom actually is. And so uh, we need to understand that the book of Proverbs falls within a broader category of wisdom literature. Some people will include the Psalms or some aspects of the Psalms, uh, but then there's Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Job, right? Those are books that are wisdom literature, okay? Uh, And so as you drill down a little bit more within the genre of wisdom literature, the Proverbs is its own little sub-genre, and and, and it names itself there in verse 1, the Proverbs of Solomon. All right, so put a pin in the uh, the proverb idea here for just a second. Solomon is the author of most of the first 22 chapters, uh, but then after chapter 22, there's a mix of different authors as well, and so know uh, that there's multiple authors we're going to be reading from here as we walk through it, but the genre of being a proverb uh, is is different than, than these other genres. We walked through Ecclesiastes a couple of years ago, and this is going to feel very different. Let me give you a definition of what a proverb is. Tim Keller, um, (laughs) there it goes. All right, here it is. Tim Keller says this, a proverb is a poetic, terse, vivid, thought-provoking saying that conveys a world of truth in a few words. They are neither absolute commands nor promises, and they are often partial. So they're neither absolute commands nor promises, and they are often partial. He likens it to this. He says a proverb is, is it helps us get re- rightly related to reality through hard thinking and sustained reflection. So here's what it's not, and here's what it is. It's not a Sour Patch Kid. It's not a Tootsie Roll. It's not a stick of gum where you just put it in your mouth and you chomp down on it and you enjoy it for uh, a second, uh, and then the flavor just kind of disappears and it's gone. It's likened to, Tim Keller says this, a, a, a piece of hard candy. It's something that we're to uh, put in our mouths and just enjoy, taste the flavor, take our time. Uh, a proverb is not something we just chomp down into. In fact, if you do, you'll lose the enjoyment of it and you might break a tooth. And so that's not uh, what a proverb is meant to do. Proverbs, as it says, they're neither commands nor promises. All right, so this isn't like reading uh, the thou shalts and thou shalt nots of the Bible. It's not like reading commands from Paul. Oftentimes, the right application of wisdom is contextual. It's based on context. Let me give you a, a proverb to prove it. Proverbs 26, answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. That's annoying, isn't it? Like, which one is it? For someone who's concrete like me, this really bothers me. I wrestled through this this week. And, and here's the point is it depends, right? I think there's twofold. One, we need to chew on these things. Two, and we'll talk about this later, I think this is meant to drive us to the source of wisdom himself. But here's what I mean by context. Here's some modern wisdom, okay? Uh, some of you, if you have you know, nieces, nephews, you've babysat, you have children or grandchildren, you may have taught your, these children the conventional wisdom of don't scream inside, all right? Don't yell indoors. Now, when you teach them that, are you saying you can never, ever raise your voice inside? No. Do you give them every single outworking of that, of all the uh, different exceptions? Well, no, you don't do that either. But they innately understand that that's applied differently when you're at a basketball game and you're cheering for your favorite team, or when you're in a room and someone attacks you or another person and you have to yell because it's an emergency situation, right? That whole don't yell inside has a contextual uh, aspect to it. And so that's often how the Proverbs work. We have to wrestle it through, um, kind of sit in it for a little while to discern what does this mean in context. Here's a phrase that's helped me over time. The Proverbs are prescriptive but not predictive. They're prescriptive. We think about them. They're, they're, They're prescribed beforehand, but they don't necessarily predict every single outcome that we're going to run across or that will come as a result. Here's a couple of working definitions of wisdom. You're like, Anthony, you said, what is wisdom? And you haven't given us a definition, and I'm starting to get annoyed. So here are a couple of definitions for you. Uh, This is from one of my seminary professors, and I I love this one. It's skill in the art of godly living. It is skill in the art of godly living. 
Here's another one by J.I. Packer. It's choosing the best and noblest end at which to aim, along with the most appropriate and effective means to do it. All right, so whichever one of those you're going to wrestle out and agree on, I don't know, but, but that's just some big picture view of what wisdom actually is. And so we're going to talk this summer about wise uses of money and parenting and work and speech and marriage and sex and, and, and a whole different list of things that we're going to wrestle with here this summer. So the prize in all of this wrestling is verse 2, to know wisdom. And so let's talk about the second point today. What does wisdom actually look like? What does wisdom look like, right? You can think about a person in your mind where you're like, yeah, I, whenever I have a question or an issue, I go to that person because they're wise. But you may not know exactly what you're talking about or know what you even mean by saying that. It's just this innate, yeah, they're wise. Like, I'm going to go and talk to them, right? Well, the first six verses here actually give us synonyms. There's essentially four synonyms, although you can probably tease out more, as to different facets of what wisdom actually looks like. And for the English majors of the room, I tried really hard for alliteration here with four Ds, but I only got three and an L for learning, and I apologize. I just couldn't make it work. So here are um, the synonyms that we can find in this passage really unpacking what wisdom looks like. And the first is discipline. In verse 2, you'll see the term instruction. You'll see it again in verse 3. 1 is knowing instruction, so that feels somewhat individual. But then 3, it's to receive it, which means uh, there's an aspect that it comes from an outside source. Uh, So this idea of instruction, it's the Hebrew term musar, uh, which can mean instruction or training. And so essentially what what it's saying that wisdom entails discipline is that uh, it's training with strong responsibility, and wisdom is something that is hard won. It's not something that we just accidentally stumble upon. It takes effort. You know, for me, and we can put this in two different generations at least, it's kind of like Mr. Miyagi, right, in The Karate Kid, or it's Cobra Kai, right, in this generation, where uh, what do they do? It's wax on, wax off. It's paint the fence, right? It's this discipline that Daniel and these people hated. But Mr. Miyagi says, if you want to be essentially wise in karate, you will be disciplined. Parallel terms for this is you'll receive correction or reproof. And so essentially to become wise is to become a disciplined person. We're not given to impulsiveness, but to self-examination, to circumspection. And and really the wise is never uh, a slave to our impulses. There's a growth in discipline. It's like someone who fixes a house, right? Uh, So I'll replace a toilet every, you know, however many years or an outlet or a hole in the wall. Uh, But every time I do it, because I do it every five years, I have to go back and figure out how to do it. I haven't been very disciplined in keeping up with it. But for my friends who have learned how to do it, and they do it over and over and over again, you know, it was amazing when we've done work on our house. They come over like, oh yeah, there's a zip, zip, zip. They pull it out. I was like, that would have taken me five weeks to replace that hole. It's because they're wise and they've been disciplined in their craft. It's personal and communal, and it takes work and accountability. Here's the second one is discernment. And this is in verse 2. It's this idea of understanding words of insight. Uh, The Hebrew term there can also mean it's discernment. So it's this idea that that it's discerning, uh, and you could really add the word between in there, right? You're discerning between blank and blank. Now it is definitely discerning between right and wrong, but it doesn't stop with that, right? Of course, wisdom is we're able to discern between what is right and what is wrong, but, but really what's captured here is we're actually able to discern between good and better and best, okay? And that's a little bit different. Again, to quote Tim Keller, he said, it's the ability to notice distinctions and shades of differences where others see only a blur. I will tell you an area where I am unwise, art, okay? We've talked about this. I'm sorry for the artist. I need you in my life to help me grow in my wisdom here. Uh, But if I go to especially some form of modern art gallery and you tell me to look at a painting and you say, which one of these is good, better, and best, I'd be like, I don't know. Like, I have no idea. And that's when I need my friend Dale Roberts. I didn't tell you I was doing this, but I'm doing it anyway, who invited me to a show one time, and he just walked through the paintings of his mentor, and he said, this was done early in his career, and you can tell, right? Because over the course of time, his, his craft improved, and you can see the difference. And he's explaining it to me. It was like one of the most eye-opening experiences I have ever had. My friend Dale is very wise in art. He can tell me the difference between good and better and best. 
I had a conversation with an investor friend uh, not too long ago when I was asking, I was like, this feels like a good investment because this number says this, is it? And he's like, okay, look, we need to have a conversation. Uh, and, and then he's like, no, like here's the differences between. He is very wise in investing. And so there's this idea uh, that you're able to, to discern between things. Now, this idea is brought forward into the New Testament. Paul actually prays for the church in Philippi that they would grow in wisdom. Philippians 1.9, he says, it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all, there it is, discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, not what is good and bad, but what is excellent, best in a field of good things. And so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ and the glory and praise of God. Friends, Whenever I recruit people to do something like become an elder or a deacon, I will often sit down and I will read this verse with them. And I will say, you are surrounded by a field of good things to invest your time and your life and your prayers into. I am calling you to discern what in your field of good things is best. Is this role best or most excellent for you right now? And I will often follow it up with, if you're saying yes to this, you need to tell me what you're going to say no to in your life, because I have yet to meet a person in suburban Pennsylvania who has tons of margin, right? And so discernment is something that is critical to us to be able to grow in wisdom. And I would argue this, is that I have noticed that this might be one of the most anemic areas that we experience as a church and as a culture. If something appears somewhat good or godly, we'll be like, well, I've got to say yes to it. And we're just operating at RPMs that we've never been meant to operate at because we're not discerning. I see it with political candidates. We're getting ready to do this. There's a candidate. He's either the devil or the savior. Like, that's where we go. And that is a complete lack of discernment. Henry Cloud, a Christian psychologist, uh, he, he uses the term good, bad, split. He said, you can tell when somebody's mature in their thinking when they don't think in binary ideas, right? Either all good or all bad, particularly in some of the areas that I just mentioned. Here's a third. Discretion. Discretion. Verse 4. It's this idea of prudence. Or verse 3, this picture of wise dealing. Discernment is this idea of it's a person who is prudent, who has good sense, who knows what to do when and when to do it. Do you know that person? Not only do they know the right thing to do or say, but they know exactly when to say it or when to do it. You know that person? Maybe it's an investor. I don't know. Maybe it's a counselor. For me, it's often a counselor. I know that counselor when I'm in that chair has been thinking this for weeks. And then finally, he just picked that time to go, well, what about this? I'm like, you've been sitting on that and you knew this was the time that I was going to respond to it, didn't you? He's very discerning, right? Very discerning. This is the one who takes the trouble to know their way and plan their discourse realistically. We can often see it when people don't quite have discernment. And I, I love my dad. My dad was a brilliant man. He had applied for so many different patents. He started so many different businesses. But we joked the last year of his life a good bit where I was like, Dad, every single one of your inventions and every single one of your businesses were about a decade too early, right? I mean, he started a satellite business, went around the country for like six weeks at a time, putting in those huge satellite dishes if you had just waited 10 years and you got those little guys, that'd have been like, that'd have been so much easier. He got into fiber optics before fiber optics were cool, right? And running information all over the world. And so we always crack that joke. And here's, here's an area where I have proven to be unwise from time to time. And some phrases maybe I have used that, that I also think show a lack of discernment. Uh, one, I just tell the truth. I just say things. I just, I'm a truth teller. No, you lack discernment. I'm a verbal processor. No. Right? I'm just saying, okay, guilty. I've said it a million times. And as I've studied God's Word, I recognize I'm actually either simple or a fool. Because maybe I do have the right thing to say, but I'm saying it at a horrific time that tears people down rather than loves them. Here's the last one. Learning. Verse 5. Let the wise hear and increase in learning. Another way of looking at that is this is obtaining knowledge. Friends, you can't be wise unless you have an informed mind that knows the heart of God. And I'm saying, because this is Christian literature, it's talking about knowing who God is. 
And one of the most annoying things that is said to a seminarian when I was leaving campus ministry and going into seminary, people are like, oh no, you're going to cemetery. Ugh. <laughs> Meaning because you're growing in knowledge, your faith is going to die. That's essentially what they're saying. Now, granted, Reformed folk can get a little too heady, right? I mean, that, that's just sometimes what happens. But we are fools if we think that we can not grow in knowledge of the things of God and be remotely wise. We're fools. I think it's beyond being simple. Why? Because another way of looking at wisdom is it's knowledge applied. If we have no knowledge, there's nothing to apply, right? Finally, where do we get wisdom? Where do we get it? Where does it come from? Do I just put my nose in the book of Proverbs all summer? In part. Here's one thing to know is that anybody can have it. Anyone can have wisdom. Proverbs 9, 4. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. Let them turn down the road of wisdom. If you are simple, you want to grow in knowledge. God is saying, it's here, it's free, it's offered to you. James, in the book of James 1, 5. If any of you lack, any, any, anybody lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously, that means he doesn't hold back, to all he doesn't discriminate without reproach or finding fault, meaning no matter how many times you've squandered the wisdom of God, he is still there at the ready if you ask him to generously dump it on you. Anyone, anyone who lacks wisdom, but it has a source. Wisdom has a source, and we can't leave this part out. And that's where we get to the motto of this entire book, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The source of true wisdom is God. Wisdom flows downhill. This verse, oops, go back. This verse in James, it says, it assumes that wisdom starts somewhere and it starts with God and he is the true giver of all true wisdom. Job says it this way, He's talking about God speaking to mankind. He says, he says to mankind, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to turn away from evil is understanding. I have learned four languages over the course of my life. I am not good in three of them, and you might argue I'm not great in the fourth, but I've learned <laughs> English, I've learned Spanish. I was a Spanish minor in college. I've forgotten most of it. Don't ask me to say anything to you after the service in Spanish. It won't happen except where is the bathroom? Um, ancient Greek and ancient Hebrew. Do you know what I had to start with to learn these languages? The alphabet. Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, He, Vav, Tat, Het, Tet, Yon, yeah, right, Yod, like, right. are you impressed? That's all I know. That's all I remember from, from Hebrew. But I had to begin with the alphabet. Here's what this is saying when it says, the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It becomes that source of wisdom, is that, is that God is the first and controlling principle. Knowing God is the alphabet. That's the alphabet. That is the beginning. It doesn't mean we can't find wisdom in other places in our world. God, in his common grace, has given us that. But true and ultimate wisdom that will not fail begins with knowing God. Now, when it says the fear of the Lord, we need to just do a quick conversation on that because what we do is we look at this idea of fear and and we quit thinking like an ancient Israelite and we import all of our modern understanding of why we fear today, right? Abuses of power, terrible parents, right? Terrible bosses, politicians that just uh, abuse power, whatever that may be. And we import all of that baggage into the fear of the Lord and go, I don't want to follow this God who's all big and scary and ready to zap me. That's not how an ancient Israelite would have understood the fear of the Lord. When you see the fear of the Lord, all caps, that means Yahweh. That's his proper name. That's how he signs his contracts, right? The fear of the Lord is a covenantal term, which means God has entered into a relationship with his people. But it is a relationship that brings a reverence to it that shows a distinction between the big C creator and the little C critter, right? Creation, that's us. And so he's saying God wants you to know him, but also wants you to keep that that in alignment, that he is God and we are not. That understanding is where it all begins. One person said sometimes we look at God as kind of being the inhaler of wisdom versus the oxygen of wisdom. 
Sometimes when we get really squirrely, God, I need wisdom, we just kind of, uh, need, we need to open our, our wisdom lungs up real quick, and so we get that hit from the inhaler, and we're doing okay for a little bit. But one pastor said, no, the beginning with God is the oxygen of wisdom. If we want wisdom, we have to look up and stay looking up. Wisdom is not in here. It's not. Why does it start with God? Why does it start with God? I think you go to the beginning of the Bible, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. When we start with the beginning, we realize, oh, I'm not God. And no created thing is God. He is the one who made it, knows how it works. He knows past, present, and future. His spirit is the only spirit who knows the heart of every single individual human being and the heart of God himself. And so to reject God is to reject that wisdom. And so, okay, how do we know God? Well, we've been talking about that for the last almost year as we've walked through the book of John. What has Jesus said time and time again? If you want to know the Father, you got to know me. If you don't know me, you don't know the Father. Friends, looking at wisdom and knowing wisdom himself is actually not hidden from us either. Paul says it very clearly in 1 Corinthians 1. He says, Because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Jesus Christ is both our example of wisdom, and he is also how we become wise. What this passage assumes is that we are fundamentally foolish at heart, rejecting wisdom at every turn because we reject God. It's our nature. It's how we're built. It's why Jesus actually had to come. You know, oftentimes we talk about Jesus coming, we talk about his passive obedience, Uh, we talk about the cross, right? He died for our sins, but we rarely talk about his active obedience. This is a theological term, but it's important for us to say briefly. Jesus came and lived a life we could not live, perfectly righteous in thought, word, and deed. You know that story about him going to the wilderness for 40 days? Usually we teach that as, as, well, here's the Bible verses you need to learn when you're tempted by Satan. And you know, that's not a terrible application of that passage. But where did Jesus go? The wilderness. How long? For 40 somethings. And he was tempted by the enemy and he didn't rebel and he didn't grumble and he didn't eat and he remained faithful to God. Who else went into the wilderness for 40 somethings, got hungry, got tempted, and then failed? Israel. You know what that story is really telling us? That Jesus is the true Israelite. He is the only faithful human being who has ever lived, who has lived righteously and wisely. And when he comes and when we accept him, his wisdom becomes ours. We are clothed in that wisdom. You know what that enables us to do? Actively rest in our quest for wisdom. I say rest because he's already become our righteousness and our wisdom right? But actively meaning he still calls us to pursue discipline, right? To pursue discernment. So he's not saying don't pursue these things, but you're never going to fully recapture that. Jesus has already done it. Let me end with these three brief things, three application points as we begin this book. The first is on your quest for wisdom, realize your quest is different than you think. If you're seeking wisdom, You are really seeking God. One pastor says, any search for wisdom is a search for the fount of that wisdom. Remember that as we go. Here's the second thing. Search in the right places. You're never going to find true wisdom in here. You're not going to find it on Instagram, per se, or whatever else that you go and look at. At least not ultimately. Again, common grace wisdom. But ultimate wisdom is going to be found here. It's going to be found as we are connected to the vine, as we are discerning in prayer how the Lord would have us walk through the situations we find ourselves in. And the third thing is, is as we go through, would you just simply receive wisdom? That sounds silly, but even at this, uh, even in this passage, where is it? Oops, lost it. Verse three: to receive instruction in wise dealings. We are going to be staring at wisdom the whole summer. You have two choices either be offended with what God God calls us to or to actually receive it. Can I encourage you to fight the urge to stiff-arm wisdom 
and to ask him, Lord, how can I receive this this summer? So friends, let's know wisdom this summer as we walk through this book. As we start with God through Jesus Christ and grow in the skill of godly living. Let me close this in prayer. Father, every single one of us in this room, apart from the cross of Christ, will one day fully demonstrate to the world that we, by nature, are fools. We are grateful that the foolishness of the cross and the life and the death and the resurrection and the current reign of Jesus Christ becomes our wisdom for us to navigate life, to learn how to love you and love our neighbors. But Lord, also for a world to see as we live in a way that pursues things like true justice and mercy as we read here in this passage. And so Lord, make us wise Make us quick to receive your wisdom. Open our hearts to what you would have us do uh, to pursue. And Lord, I pray above all else that we would stay connected to the vine because that is where the fruit of wisdom will come. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this time. And we pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, friends, let's respond um, to his generosity as we uh, receive the general offering this morning and meditate on this passage from the book of Proverbs. Friends, if you would, please stand and let's pray this prayer together as we conclude this time of giving from 1 Chronicles 29. Please read with me. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. Let's conclude in song this morning. Thank mm-hmm. you.
I'm about to read came to mind because I thought about how many of us are going, okay, we're here this summer. We, we're going to get wisdom, right? Uh, but, but I also want us to pursue that while also resting in Christ being our wisdom and His guarantee to work in us that which is pleasing in His sight. And so as you leave here today, receive this benediction from the book of Hebrews. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Christ Jesus, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen, friends. Go in peace. Greet someone new or first and second service on the way out. All right. (laughs)